do. Hello, I'm good kind evening. Of... Oh, it's almost evening. It's only day one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, welcome to our third and final session of the day for our short stay. Uh, we are entering the last session of the day for our short stay. Um, we're going to go on the distribution. And we have a panel of four um, coming from a traditional and a future perspective. So um, I will leave you to Brian and to your thoughts. Right, here we go. Um, now, yeah, you're absolutely right, we've definitely got the kind of old, I'm, gonna say, I don't, I'm not going to say it's the old versus the new, but we've got the old and the new represented. And what we're going to ask again is um, really for you to do some show and tell. Um, I think we want to hear, uh, I think people have a very, very brief kind of outline of what you all do. Um, but I, if, you, if you wouldn't mind um, bringing that to life a bit for us. Um, let's start, should I start with old or new? I don't know what to do. Uh, uh, Derek, I'm going to let you take a breath, uh, because you've literally just got off the plane. <laughs> so do you want to explain to us um, what you do and what your relationship with shorts is? Okay, so I'm going to start this then. Um, well, I'm Susanne Folkesan, and I'm from a Swedish educational broadcasting company, and I would like to show you how it is in Swedish. It's UR. And in English, that would be Swedish Educational Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Very difficult to understand, <laughs> but that's the truth. Yeah. And uh, I'm uh, working with acquisition, and I'm also working for youth department, children, and our knowledge channel. And um, mainly I'm buying documentaries for our knowledge channel, but I also buy these short films for our youth department. And we are buying about uh, an average of 900 minutes a year. And uh, we are using it for language studies. And uh, so we have this uh, Sunday show where we show short films. And then we also provide them on a website so that you can go into different kind of portals where you can find French, Spanish, English, German, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Russian, and all the Swedish minority languages as well. And um, did I mention Chinese, Russian, Italian as well? <laughs> so there's a lot of languages that we are trying to, to cope with. And um, well, so the short think, films that you're buying, so the short films that you're buying are largely for language films. Yes, okay, fine. but they had to be very appealing to the audience yep. because the audience are between 12 and 20 years old. So we're trying to have a variety of films, but mainly... How, it, do you, how do you program, program them across the channel? Like in what sort, of situa what sort of context do they screen? It's like, we, we call it the, the short film club, right. but in Swedish then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 So, and so what does that mean? What does it How means that we have a different kind of short films that's provided at uh, 5 o'clock Sunday evenings. And then it's also aimed for um, <coughs> the schools. So we have this kind of, since uh, our main goal is to provide all the films that we buy to the, to the schools around uh, in Sweden. Right. And uh, we do that with uh, audiovisual centers that are spread around the country. And they provide the schools with either DVDs or uh, linked by closed networks. So that uh, it's our goal is that the teachers would like to use these short films just to get a glimpse of the, of the language and to make it appealing to learn a language. Because you can see, you can get the culture in the country and you get um, updated uh, topics that they can discuss, for example, it can be about relationships or um, everyday life. So we're trying to make it a good opportunity to learn a language. Okay. Very good. Do the audiovisual centers rent out the films or is it a free service? It's a free service, okay. so it's a non-commercial basis. Right, but, you, but for screening on the channel, you pay Rights, you pay fees to, to the filmmakers? We pay fees to the filmmakers, yes. Okay, is it lucrative for them? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's something? <laughs> it's something, yes. Okay. No, so it's, it's average prices, so it's, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's like we're buying for the documentaries. It's, it's about the same unit price, so. Right, and is it per, on a per second basis or on a. Uh, pardon me. On a, how do you price them? How do you, how do you set the fees? 
we we set fees in. I mean, that's a negotiation. So it's usually we buy it from distributors. So if you have made a film, um, hopefully you should get connected with a distributor because that's much easier for everybody. Because we have this specific kind of rights. We had to have it for the TV right, and we had to have the web right, and we also have the audiovisual center rights to, to provide it to the schools. And the, all the distributors that we are connected to, they, all, they know all about this. So it's very convenient both for you, I guess, if you are connected to a distributor, and for us as well. Since you're buying so many programs, it's, it's easier for everybody. Um, and is there, so you, you said a little bit about um, the kind of films that you're looking for, so I think that might show the culture or specifics about the language. Can yes, you, and it has to have a language then, since it's, it has, since to, it has to have a dialogue. Yes, okay. So um, these yes. So, but, um, and it can't be too abstract, because then it can be difficult to understand. If, if, I mean, if you're learning, for example, Italian, Usually they learned Italian for maybe three or four years, and the level is not that very <coughs> high then, so if yes. it's too yes. difficult dialogue, you can't understand anything. But maybe then, if it's a kind of linear story, you get a glimpse of it anyway, because it's not too abstract. Right. And presumably you subtitled them? We subtitled them, yes. Okay. Both in English and the, the language that they are supposed to learn them. So for example, if it's a French film, we have both in Swedish and in French. So you can choose, if you look at the website, for example, I you see. can choose which kind of subtitle you like to have. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, so that's a very, one very, very specific- Very specific, um, yes. Uh, model for, for buying and screening and exhibiting uh, short films. Okay. Yes. Derry, does that ring any bells for you? How, tell me how your um, TV exhibition of well, our company, Network Ireland Television, uh, has been active in the short film distribution business for the last 17 years. Um, it's mentioned, I think, in the, in the blurb. And uh, we, we're primarily a mainstream television program distribution company that has specialised in short film since the start-up, basically. And the reason we did that was because we couldn't access drama generally because at the time in Ireland um, the broadcasters paid for and owned outright all the drama that, that was produced in the country so the only access we had to drama was through short films and over the last 18 years we've or 17 or 18 years I had a beautiful head of brown hair when I started doing this. <laughs> and, and dealing with producers on short films over the years has aged me before my time, I might add. But um, we, we're in the traditional uh, area of television distribution. We, um, we go to m most of the key uh, short film markets, but we also have the benefit, I suppose, of going to both the television markets, MIP TV in April and MIPCOM in October, where we do have opportunities of meeting <coughs> some of the short film buyers who wouldn't necessarily um, be active at the, the mainstream markets like Clermont Ferrand mm -hmm. or this market here and uh, Toronto, which I would think is, are there are three of the more active. Uh, uh, Berlin, I, I've gone to, but oh, it's more Toronto, the Toronto, Toronto, Toronto worldwide. in the summer, uh, worldwide. worldwide okay. um, Berlin has uh, a shorts market, but I think it's primarily focused on features, and I have been there, but I don't really think uh, many of my buyers particularly go there. So we're dealing directly with the broadcasters in the main, or the DVD distributors um, who compile uh, DVD compilations, which you know, has been sporadic business over the years. Um, in certain areas, like uh, with gay films, there are always um, DVD compilations that are regularly put out uh, in the UK, the US, and so on. And there is a very steady market for those sorts of films. In the general compilation sector, I mean, um, you know, uh, as James knows himself, it's a 
it's a very sporadic sort of business. Um, the license fees, are, the guarantees, the minimum guarantees you would get would be very small uh, because nobody is absolutely sure how they're ever going to sell. Um, and uh, so most of our business is done, as I say, directly with the broadcasters. We go to the markets to look for new films for the catalogue. Um, this market here is normally a particularly uh, fertile one for, for our company. Uh, we've usually picked up six to ten films every time we, we come here. Um, and we're looking for mainstream um, dramas. Um, we're looking for linear films. We want a film to have a start, a middle and an end. Um, our buyers rarely, if ever, buy abstract films unless it's um, arty. So that, you know, if they're, if they're looking for experimental films, we're not the sort of company that specializes in that. It's, it's too hit and miss, I think, to, to be actually able to say to a producer, yes, I love your film, uh, we're going to be able to do the dibble and all with it and get so many sales for you. It doesn't really work that way. And the market in the last 18 months, particularly for short films, has certainly slowed down dramatically. And it's primarily because many of the buyers who regularly buy from us, like the, the buyer in YLE in Finland, who always show uh, short films either in separate strands of shorts, a bit like uh, Suzanne was saying, or as fillers throughout the course of the week, um, they've just had their budgets chopped. And uh, the buyers uh, tell us up front, look, you know, I may have a budget later in the year, but right now I'm at clermont Ferrand. I'm looking at films, but I can't actually say I'm going to buy any of them. So uh, short films are a discretionary buy for most buyers, that's, or for most broadcasters. That's the problem. And most broadcasters, whether you like it or not, will use short films as fillers. So that means if there's a gap in the schedule at 10 minutes past 2 in the morning, they'll shove a short film in there. Um, and you know, directors and producers don't like hearing that, but really there are very few dedicated short slots. Um, do you think that's changed dramatically? I mean, do, is that just a financial imperative? Do you think that's because there are other ways that people can receive shorts? Receive shorts? Uh, I, no, I think the, the broadcasters who've always shown shorts, like Canal Plus, obviously, around the world, um, will always want shorts. Uh, but I think in certain territories um, where they, like YLE, like Finland, for instance, where they use them as fillers, they've had to cut back. Um, I don't know if, I mean, if anything, internet distribution of shorts will restrict the main broadcaster's interest in continuously buying shorts. So I would say there has been probably uh, although nobody's actually said it to us, but I, I'd say there has been a sort of a, a falling off, maybe in general interest in shorts across the board. Having said that, Channel 4 are talking about resurrecting a dedicated short strand next year. Um, where, you know, that, that used to be the home of short films in the UK. Um, and since they cut their three minute wonder slot, um, they're really, apart from their Four, anim four, what, formations, uh, animation series that they fund or co-fund. There hasn't been an awful lot of uh, short film production from internal. Year. There's been a bit, yeah, there's been a bit there, that's right. So um, I don't know if that's been very helpful or not. We have about 850 shorts in our catalogue. We've been very selective about the films we've taken in because we really feel an obligation to the producer and director that we're hopefully going to do some business for his film why else would we want to take it on? Um, on the supply side, as you probably know, it's very important for, for any distributor to have their um, producer or director promote the film heavily at the festival uh, side of things because it's like in the old days of the record business where you, know, you got your record plays and that generated interest and sales and so on. It's the same with uh, festivals. We've had a couple of films at the Brest Film Festival last week, and um, 
we've already had a couple of inquiries from Canal Plus buyers who say we've seen two of your films at that festival, we want to buy them, uh, which is great, uh, except it's a bit early in the whole process for that, those films that they want, so we're telling them, you know, it'll be next October before those films will be available for broadcast, because you, as the director, producer, need to do the first 12 months on the festival circuit and generate some sort of profile for your film, some sort of buzz, hopefully, if it starts even just getting into various festivals, that alone, as we know, is a major achievement with the number of short films that are out there looking to be selected. But if you go on to have certain you know, uh, citations or awards at festivals, obviously that is, is, a, is a real, um, what's the word? A real score for your film and it brings it to the attention of the buyers and uh, it helps the, the distributor to sell the film in the long run. Okay, I want to go back to yes. lots of things that yeah. you said, particularly your experience in the music industry and how the kind of lessons or otherwise that we might learn yeah. from that. But just, just so that we've got the kind of whole context of this discussion, let's go to the, the new side of things now. Um, Danny, do you want to start? Um, just kick us off. I think you might have something to show us, is that right? Yeah, I'll tab me. You are? Oh, right. <laughs> instructed on the alt tab <clears throat> we we do we run this website called Vodo um, it it's probably just helpful if I just tell you the story of how we sure. started doing this and because you look at that and it, 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 it's, it's it's much drier than the story would suggest so we made a film in 2000 in 2006 called steal this film and it was about piracy and about how um, so this is why I don't like putting slides up <clears throat> because everyone looks at the slide. Well, <laughs> um, uh, we, we, we basically released a film that we considered, we considered the option of um, sharing the film freely as a kind of, for us it looked like a really good deal. You know, we, we looked at pirate sites where there were millions of users, you know, millions of people downloading films without restriction, and we thought, that looks, that looks neat, and we want that audience, and we're prepared to share the film freely, and we, to us that looked like a rational thing to do. We made the film very cheaply, and we put it out, and, it, and I think um, reached a couple of million people in the first, first few months. And one, one of the amazing things that happened was that we, re we received a, a, a less than $10,000, but $10,000 in, in completely voluntary contributions from the audience. And, this was kind of wild for us, it's a completely unexpected thing, and, and we then we used that money and some money from uh, some friends at BritDoc, uh, the British Documentary Film Foundation, to make another part, and then we tried to become slightly more intelligent and said, okay, look, if, you, if you're going to donate, if you want to donate $15 or more, we'll give you a mystery gift pack, and at this point, like, like almost everybody, 98% of people donated $15 <coughs> or more, and suddenly it went from you know, less than 10,000, over $40,000. Well, different things over time. We didn't have a kind of, you know, factory production thing, so it was very random. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a mystery, right? <laughs> so, but the interesting thing is just realizing that people, that, that, that one, that the economics, because, and as I was saying earlier, I had no idea at the time when I was then invited to film festivals and so on, about that when we, I would sort of shamefacedly say, well, we distributed Steal This Film to, it turned out eventually, like six million people watched it, you know, puts it just underneath sort of zeitgeist and loose change as one of those crazy internet famous films. And, uh, we, you know, but we only got $40,000. And not one bugger on the panel, as I now know today, is a shame on them, would say, we've never made $40,000 for any filmmaker online. You know, we've never cut anybody a check like that. And I went up through about three years like that <laughs> before I finally started knowing people well enough to hear the numbers that they were doing, you know. And then I was thinking, you bastards, you didn't, excuse me, so, sorry, but you didn't, you, you didn't tell me. And I felt like we were the small guy. And then I understood why all these filmmakers were coming up to me and saying, well, how did you do it? You know, because I thought we were the sort of shame-faced option, right? Make a shonky film, no options to distribute it, DIY it, give it away, and, and see what comes back. But over the time, you know, it's so many filmmakers approached us and said, like, we'd like to do it that way, because either they've made something... You know, in our case, it was both shabby and militant film. You know, not a good combination 
for, for, for getting out to, to TV or whatever. Um, in other people's case, it can be just strange, you know, or, or really personal visions or stuff they DIY. You know, just there are reasons why things don't make it to telly or even to DVD. And so those people are all really interested in how they could do the same thing. And eventually, to be honest, I just got bored of, of telling them. And I thought, let's build a, let's build a, a system that does it. So what we've done is we, we um, created a structure that lets people submit their films and uh, we've done, made partnerships with many of the biggest um, non, um, what would you call them, Pirates. ad hoc, uh, yeah, well, let's try to avoid that, uh, ad hoc, uh, non-constituted um, <laughs> di distributors, you know, of, of, of film. Well, in some cases, yes, that we have got a relationship with the Pirate Bay, for example, um, and just to give you an idea of the value of the Pirate Bay to a filmmaker, you know, it will easily produce, and they'll often take down their front page logo, replace it with an advert for one of our films, and they will easily produce half a million downloads a week. And of those half a million downloads, that will frequently convert to $10,000. Because what we've learned... there's a thing on there which says we suggest you donate? Or we'll yeah, well, this is the thing. We've kind of refined what we're doing over time because it's gone from the sort of uh, donate if you feel like it or don't kind of attitude, which produces certain results, you know. It has the benefit if you keep your pride intact, but it does not cause people to donate as much. And then kind of really, like, with the Yes Men, really, like, they were really selling the... Um, we distributed the Yes Men Fix the World, this documentary don't know whether you know it, um, and it got like, I think, three quarters of a million downloads, and I think they made about $50,000 from us, and again, it was the biggest check, they'd been cut by anybody, and they were really selling the issue, you know, it was like, donate to us because you're donating to an issue, but what we gradually realized over time is that the cleverer you are about what you offer people, basically what you're doing is you're distributing a film, obviously free, to a very large no number of people, presuming you have the rights to do that. And, that's a, and then you're, you, what's happening is a very small number of those people are engaging really passionately with your work. It can only, you know... Do you it's, think it does, that, does it only work for a certain type of film? No, it works across all sorts of different films. Like we made 50,000 bucks for The Yes Men, uh, and we made $100,000 recently for a for science fiction show that we, we developed which is t tiny if you think about the budgets of sci-fi or something, but if you're a 24-year-old kid straight out of film school in New York, it's apparently enough to make a whole series. <laughs> so, so, you know, they're delighted. And, and what we've worked out is that, you know, take, you take the incentive seriously. It's a bit like on Kickstarter, you know, where you, you, know, you set these incentives and you sort of take them seriously and think, okay, things people like are, you know, limited edition things, signed things, personalized things and they like to have their name in the credits. They love it. And, I, and in the end, you can roll your eyes, and, and I sort of initially feel this, felt the same way, and then you start thinking, yeah, but if somebody's not in film, you know, and they have got an I office job, and they... I was wrong eyes, because that's always been the way. All oh, right. <laughs> okay, you mean like rich guys just buying the, the, the exact producer <laughs> credit, whatever, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a sort of like a micro version of that. It's sort of crappy patronage, you know. But... <laughs> but, but why do I say these things on camera about my, <laughs> about my own business? But you know, it's, it's, it's really fascinating because, you know, obviously someone has kicked in, you know, $100 or whatever, and they, the film is being seen by a million people, and you are getting your name in front of something that's being seen. So, well, that's enough for I've probably said way too much, but. Um, no, that's fascinating. So, how many films have you. The website is up and running. Yeah. And how many films have you distributed in this way? Uh, well, it, there's two answers, because we try to do one a month that we get behind and we release, and that means we really promote it, we really like work with all these partners we're developing and try to make sure it's really pirated a lot. Um, and that, you know, that because that's what gets the money in, that's what develops the kind of aura of the film. And then, and then other people, people who are not part of that program can also just upload their films and make use of the infrastructure, because in the end, we have now got like three quarters of a million visitors a month on the site. So you benefit to some extent from having your film up there. Because all the free stuff we're putting out brings people in, right? So then other filmmakers that we're not going to get behind for various reasons, like even we have standards kind of thing. No, I don't. I, should, uh, <laughs> I, I, should, I shouldn't say that. Is it divided up into short features, docs, fiction? What's the, yeah. what is the, what's the kind of divide? Uh, we've done probably 
half and half so far. And we've had um, the most successful thing has been science fiction. I mean, genre is obviously really working. It, well, it's like, yeah, 25% uh, women, you know, just less than 2020. So it's not that bad. Could be worse, given that we're dealing with like the edge of sort of peer to peer geekery. Could be worse. So, you know, but, the, you know, you can see the stats. It's not like it's not going to stay boys' game forever. Yeah. So, you know, come on, come and tell us what you want to see. You know. Fantastic. All right. That's, well, that's <laughs> quite a new model. Okay. Um, and, and yours is so new, it's not even, does exist yet. Uh, no, we do exist. Um, I run a company called Charge Play. It's um, an internet distribution um, service for filmmakers. It does exist. It's running. It all works. We haven't officially launched because there's lots of things that we're doing to improve the service. Hopefully, it will improve forever. But um, it fits somewhere in between YouTube and Vimeo and a broadcaster. Um, there's lots of tools. But what I did is I brought a video, which is only a minute long, because we're a short film festival. Uh, I thought you could have a look at this, if that's okay, and it'll explain everything. Yeah. Can I play in this? If you have a film to distribute, ChargePlay makes it easy to sell and stream your film to viewers over the Internet. You may have a sales agent. You might even have a great sales agent and some sales. But there is still more you can do to find your audience. And distributing online can improve your release window. The Internet is a perfect platform for distributing content. Your audience can be anywhere. But uploading your film to free video sharing websites could cause problems. Now, there's ChargePlay. ChargePlay makes it easy and safe to distribute your film on the Internet. Upload your film, add a trailer, and we take care of the rest. We give you a single line of code and you can sell from your website, sell through social networks, or you can simply link to a charge play page. Block territories where you have traditional sales agreements and provide encrypted, secure streaming through the world's biggest network to everyone else. Everyone is happy. Upload your library today and start earning immediately. Join the future of film distribution. Charge Play, the film distribution engine. Talk me through that American accent. I love it. Voiceofgarth.com. <laughs> <laughs> so Go there, he's brilliant. So good. Um, All right, so tell us, tell us, give, us the, give, us, give us the give us the real story. How does all that work? Um, so, if you've got a film and you want to sell it on the internet, you've essentially got to do a number of things to um, get the reach out there, get it, the ability for people to view it, and then you've got to do different stuff, which is to get people to, um, to view it, to come to your platform or wherever it is. That's kind of what Jamie's doing there, um, that ability to reach an audience. If you wanted to put a film on your website, if you wanted to distribute yourself, if you wanted to self-distribute, You'd have to do four basic things, four things that we kind of encompass in ChargePlay. You encode your file, you find a player so that you can, anyone can play it, and that's a different player for lots of different devices. You need a server network so it won't fall over if a million people watch it at the same time, and you need some way of taking payment. So it's relatively simple. All ChargePlay does is bundle all those together and make it really easy. So you can upload a file, and then it does all that for you automatically. And that works at the moment. Okay. So that, that's what we're running. And your financial model? Um, in the future, we will either take a percentage of the sales, okay. or we will charge for bandwidth. Uh, essentially, um, you can charge whatever you want, and we would always charge the same. At the moment, it's completely free. So we're running the whole thing. You can use it, you can upload for free. Can we use it? You can use it, yeah. I don't, I don't mind I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Um, the idea behind it really is that the, with the short code, you can put that anywhere on the net. So you can put it on blogs, you can put it on email, your signature, you can put it on forums, have your website, other people's websites. So, it's different from embedding in your YouTube. No, exactly the same. So it's, it's the same video that is played lots of different places. So if you hadn't got it anywhere else, 
it would be very easy on the search engines. A lot of this came out of search engine work with search engine optimization I was doing with other things. The, the listings will be your film, your legitimate film that people have to pay for a number of times. So it's not about eliminating the chance of it ever being out there anywhere else. It's giving the opportunity for people to buy it very easily and they're getting a legitimate copy of that. And what we do is in the interface, um, there's a demo demonstration on the website. The payment is all through PayPal, but it's all transparent. So you don't ever go off to PayPal and come back. So it's all about in the moment, if someone wants to purchase the film, they can buy it for 50p, 99 cents, whatever you decide, and you get that money transferred to you. And on our charging model that works, but we haven't rolled it out, that money will still come to you instantly, and we just take the commission out of that. So it's, it's an instant delivery of the funds to you, so you can launch a product and have money in your PayPal account the same day, the same minute that someone buys it. So it sits somewhere in between, um, like I said, YouTube and Vimeo, and selling your film for, for broadcast or somewhere like that. And we're, we're, what we're hoping is that people can um, do a film festival tour and upload it to our service and have it available for people at that time where it's important. If it's a film festival, you can have it available for people at a premium, say a pound, two pounds, whatever. And then if you make sales, you can knock those off if you sell them, but you're not um, precluding yourself from sales in the future or other film festivals because it's not out on the ones that they don't like you and it's not out there for free anywhere. Um, that's where it fits, really. Well, we hope it fits. <laughs> Um, and is there any, you, you said it's sort of halfway between this and this, is, is there any other model that's like it, or is it as new as it sounds? Um, I hope so. We're looking at having a front-facing website where people can come to us and view the content, because at the moment what we're finding is that people are having to promote their own film still, and that's a very difficult thing. So it is, the, the ones that are doing well are things like educational videos and things where people are paying a premium for that small, it's not, a massive audience isn't able to see those films. There are some that do quite well, but they're for different reasons. So, But it's like video on demand. I mean, it's, it's exactly, yeah, it's a yeah. pay-per-view video on yeah, demand yeah, system. Yeah. Yeah. Darren, what do you think about Richard's model? I think he's just described the problem with it. Uh, the fact that, like, iTunes, right? There is something like 12 million tunes on iTunes, but surveys have proven that there's only 300,000 of those active at any, you know, for any consistent period of time. So the more choice you have, the more promotion you've got to do to actually distinguish your film from everyone else's. And I think that is the problem with everyone's website, including, you know, producers, some of whom I think have quite sophisticated websites where you can actually go and buy, you know, a, a DVD of their film that might have been nominated for an Oscar or whatever. And um, how do you promote that to the general public so they're aware that they can get a film that, you know, I mean, you mentioned trailers early on, and I'm sure, you know, if you can see a trailer for nothing, it could inspire you to say, well, that sounds good, or looks good, I want to download the whole film. Um, I'm not sure whether it's, it's automatically required that your producer supply a, a, a trailer, or do you actually, are you in a position where you can make trailers for them or anything like that? Yeah, what we do at the moment is if you don't upload a trailer, we take the first two minutes, yeah, yeah. so you can preview the film. Yeah. Um, if you do have a trailer, you can also have the first two minutes, so someone can watch that. Um, but you could upload a trailer that is not necessarily a trailer, but as long as you like, you know, you can choose to do that. I mean, the other thing I should say, and they're not here to defend themselves, but Shorts International are the gatekeepers for, uh, for iTunes. And so anyone, who, anyone on the distribution side, like myself, or Premium Films in Paris, or uh, What Media in, in um, Canada, we're all, we're all in a small club. We all know each other. We all talk to each other. We're friendly competitors. Uh, even the in source, uh, the Shorts International people we know and love. Um, <laughs> the thing with iTunes, though, is again uh, we've got three years' experience now of having, uh, thankfully, having an Oscar-nominated film in 2009, two Oscar-nominated films 
in 2010 and two this year. And the sales from iTunes for those films, I mean, you know, they're nothing like what uh, our friend here is talking about. So uh, I think it's been hyped up a lot. And I think even though iTunes promote the fact that these are Oscar nominated shorts available to download for one ninety nine or whatever it is, yeah. dollars, um, there's no massive uptake. I, I mean, watch. everyone would like to believe, and you can see why everyone would like to believe that out of the chaos of the destruction of the old distribution system, you know, iTunes, YouTube, and maybe someone else would emerge to be the stable center of power, and that you could just deal with them as if as you used to deal with the TV or whoever, and you would get you know. But I just don't think that's how it works. And in terms of this question of building, there is kind of good news though, because this question of how do you get people to want to see a thing, part of that fragmentation that's occurred, and the chaos that's ensued afterwards means that there are these new centers of power of in terms of production of attention. You know, that's how we're using the Pirate Bay. It's actually eminently, it's just practical, you know, because in the end, they've got 15 million people a day. But there are people like Reddit or Dig or, you know, places where people were, which are aggregating attention, you know, in, in unexpected places. And that means it's unexpected in the sense that no one's approaching them with decent commercial deals. And you can go to them and just say, listen, let me take you for lunch and suggest that could you promote this to your audience. And if you're canny about where those centers of power are, so it's not completely, what I'm trying to say is it's not, um, it's not as glum a story as it for how we get people to want to see things. It actually is devolving into our hands slowly. Or like Stephen Fry on Twitter. Or, but the great question you know, is not how you get people to see things, it's how you get people to see things and pay for it. Yeah. Isn't that what you're talking about? Well, yeah. first to get them to want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I think that's far more the problem than, than... I think that will happen at some point. I don't think that's happening now on a large scale. Yeah. But we're, we're talking... We've, in the past, we've always looked at something where you have a, a broadcaster that has sort of aggregated content to some extent broadcast to a large audience. But what the internet allows you to do is have a much narrower field of view and to appeal to people in a much smaller genre. And that's kind of what our system is trying to appeal to. So you can have 100 people watching your film and paying a tenner for it or whatever, and that will still work as a business model. It doesn't necessarily have to follow the line of, you know, a million people watch it on a broadcaster to be a successful film. It's appealing to different I people. I want to be nice ways. to you, but I've got to, I really have to disagree. As I was saying before when we were talking earlier, I've yet to see anybody's stats. From, I want to see... I'd love to talk to you in a year. It depends on what the what aim the, is. I want to know. see the... Well, nobody's aim is to make $5 a month, you know, on their film. And um, that, that's the problem. The long tail, this thing, that this, this idea of the long tail, that was really popular for a long time, you know. It was a big, like, Wired magazine promoting it thing. And gradually, it's just like the long tail itself has gone into the long tail, you know. It's like nobody's really interested in that idea anymore. Do, 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 do explain the long tail. Oh, well, the idea that, it's what you were talking about, that, uh, Derry, that, that there's any, in any system, any way you look, there's this bell curve yeah. where the things that are in the centre, you know, like the IQ test, right? That the idea is you've got the most people have an IQ around 100 and then it tails off on either side. That's how it's designed. And it's the same thing with like Lady Gaga and whatever else is in the middle. And in films, you know, Iron Man, Spider-Man, whatever, and everything else falls off into the... And the idea of the long tail was that this, this is the long tail then, the bit at, the bits at the end that no one's... Known, the, the very dumb people or the very indie films or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and the idea was, well, yes, you're very indie, but we can help you because in the end it doesn't cost anything to serve each copy of the film and you can sit there and appeal to the, this, this niche audience globally. And that will make it a still long tail significant because you've got two extensions, one through space and one through time. It can just sit there temporarily for a long time. It doesn't cost you anything to have it there. And it can reach people across borders because of the internet. And what's happened is everyone's realized, well, yeah, but I'm selling like 15 copies of my book a week and I'm just, it's not helping me. You know, I'm not getting any cleverer. Or whatever. You know, it's like, so, 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 so that's the problem and what people, and so why I think why I think you're right to have a portal, you know, and to try to build attention, is everything I've seen is that it's the other way around, actually. If what you, people will like anything if you, can get, if you can get either enough money or enough other people to tell them to like it. Like, I was amazed with Steal This Film, it's not that good. After five million people saw it or whatever, I never had anybody ever say to me, Steal This Film's a bad film. 
because they assume it's good because everyone else told them it's good. What do and you if you think it's good, well, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I made it. I thought it was interesting because no, I, I made I'm, it. I'm sorry, I'm old-fashioned, and I, I really am. I'm showing my age now. Um, I actually believe, you know, the problem with the internet. And I don't honestly think it's still going to catch on. I think in 10 years' time, it'll be dead. <laughs> the, the, internet's going to, the internet's going to be full. There'll be no room for stuff going on it. Um, but here's what I really think. I really, think. Quality, I really hope you're serious. Quality will always out. I really believe, you know, people uh, get this, uns what do they call it? Unsolicited? No, it's un consumer-generated content. And seriously and truly, people, 99.9% .9 of it is rubbish. And, you know, what we've done is we've... Those are two of, different arguments, though. No, no, but we've conditioned people Those are two to go on the internet and, and spend their time looking at pretty crap uh, videos. Well, I enjoy Charlie so Bit Me. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> and I think that, you know, the, the quality issue still has to be met. And I think we're talking to, hopefully, producers who will ultimately want to make a quality film uh, that will actually mean something in 10 years' time. But you're saying two different things, and you're saying exactly what... I was talking to the dude who runs um, Lion, Lionsgate in, the, in Europe, and he was saying exactly the same thing. We don't really need help with finding new talent, because I, I mean, he said it seriously, we see everything that's good. Everything that's good makes its way through the festivals in an orderly fashion. I'd never... And I'd reaches... Never. Well, you said talent will out, you know? Talent no, I said I, I talent... Don't, should, I don't think I that's think true. talent should be what's driving this. And unfortunately, on the internet, it's not driving this. No, but that's not true, though. I mean, in fact, we're, re we're reaching a place where, you know, raw talent could be... could find, help you find your way through. Whereas before, people get, you know, in front of the traditional gatekeepers and they get knocked down. And many of them don't return to have another go, because it's tough, you know? You get knocked down. Like, have you ever been in front of a commissioner? Yes. Like, I'll give you an example. Channel 4 asked me to come up with a science fiction show for them. So I came up with a show. This is recently submitted it and everything. And I, I know the person who's involved in the production, the, the commissioning process. It obviously got submitted to some internal process. I probably spent you know, two, three days doing it. And I got a note back recently, you know, thank you for submitting your application to the Channel 4 application robot. Unfortunately, we don't really make science fiction at Channel 4. Thank you. Goodbye. And you think, right, you know, just think how many, like, you, you, you've got no idea if I'm a talented writer or not. You may just think I'm an untalented hack. It's possible. But still, think about how many people are producing stuff in contexts like that and getting knocked down by the traditional gatekeepers. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not the case that there's a smooth path to recognition for talented people now. Actually, it's obviously there's an oversaturation of work and with people being able to make things for less money, being able to show things on these methods of accessibility, people are swamped and therefore things will be missed. And it's that the, in the media, I mean, advertising has the same problem, all these things, because people can choose to look at it or not. They think they can be clever and go on the internet and sell a car by having a clever short film made and seeded, but ultimately, I think Jerry's right. I think if you make something really good and people want to see it, that's a solution as opposed to people... No, why aren't the TV stations playing shorts anymore? Sorry? Why aren't the TV stations playing, playing shorts anymore? Well, there is just outlines that this problem that he's facing at the moment in a lean year because yeah. people have had their budgets cut because the ratings are down. Because no one's watching the shorts in the way that they used to anymore. Like six reality and so, shows. Bear in, mind, bear, in mind, bear in mind now have a nice smooth path, as Jamie described, for the talent. The kind of talent he needs to get the kind of sales he does well done. But that's not going to last forever. No, uh, and, and we are, I mean, we are talking to VOD people all the time. And I think, you know, the problem has been, uh, you know, what what commercial model is actually going to work? And I think, who is that French company that set up and, and was going to do the dibble and all and actually walked away from it after spending, I don't know, how many millions? Um, I can't, I can't, Babel gum. They weren't exactly. French, Italian. Italian. No, they weren't, sorry, Italian. Yeah. And then there's a crowd in Canada, authentic, I, authentic, I think they're called. Um, you know, 
there's plenty of platforms out there, yeah. and they're, they've all got a you know a different way of charging or whatever. But do the two things have could, could the two things two options not coexist? They can, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think uh, what well the traditional way would be to have the festivals because if anything goes on the internet, right, and if you're ultimately possibly thinking long term and saying, well, I might have an op uh, I might have a chance of having my film considered for an, an Oscar. Uh, and I mean, you know, if you're a serious director, uh, the guys I know who are in the business and in a serious way, I want maybe ultimately to be able to walk up the red carpet uh, on the Kodak Theatre. Uh, that's as good as it's going to get for a short filmmaker, I think, in terms of uh, acclaim by his peers. Um, well, it, the minute it goes up on the internet, and if, if uh, you, you can't put it in for Oscar consideration, because the, but the are you really saying? Very but you really, surely? I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a question no, of balancing. No, I'm sorry. I'm talking from a quality position here. That's where I, That's the position I've taken. Right? Yeah, but I also think. That, I mean, I, I also think that if a, if a, if a, if a short filmmaker or, or a new filmmaker puts their film out and gets online free and gets you know and does preclude themselves from walking up the red carpet. But you know, the day the, the day or the two weeks after we released steal this film, we were receiving 400 emails a day from people, you know, viewers, like pe real people who'd watched the film, engaged with it, and said, you know, this represents me, I see myself here, I'm giving you five dollars because, I'm giving you five hundred dollars because, I'd, you know, Depends what I would give is, away a red carpet any day for that kind of engagement with real people, because that's, and I believe that's why a lot of people are making films and choosing to express themselves, and the reason I get quite exercised by this is because I see lots of people who are withholding withholding rights to their film, basically withholding, basically doing what film is meant to be seen, and they're stopping it from being seen for the future potential promise of A, recognition within an old system that's dying, and B, di distribution by a system that hasn't got space for them anymore. I think that's a really and big those, problem. And that strikes me as a tragedy uh, for young people and for new filmmakers, and one that, one that distributors and shouldn't really be promulgating anymore. You know, as a, as a, you know, or at the very least, presenting other options to them. I told you I was old-fashioned, but um, I, I think uh, you know there is there is room for both. But I think the way we would suggest it as a as a as distributor of films that we think broadcasters want to broadcast, as opposed to what you can throw up on the internet any day of the week, is you do the festival circuit for twelve months, then it goes to television and it can also go almost simultaneously to VOD. And that's fine, you know. But there, the, I think if you shoot yourself in the foot, if you, don't, if you have a film that has any chance of winning festival awards and maybe a qualifying festival for an Oscar, why jeopardize that by putting it on the internet too soon? You can be an internet hit with your four million hits, and it doesn't mean a damn sometimes in terms of return to you in terms of kudos from the industry, recognition or whatever. That's, that's the way I see it. And I kind of, I kind of feel that you, you can do it both ways, but surely for people, for people like me, I'm quite young, I've, I've made a few short films. Sorry? <laughs> well, no, I'm just, all I'm saying is that, okay, ultimately my dream might be to walk down the red carpet, but if it's I'm, everybody's dream. I know, but if <laughs> but if someone if you, you if want to admit it, but it's there. If you want to get noticed, dormant. if you want to get noticed, isn't it good to start out by putting your films online to show that you're there to make sure you're apparent, and then people will notice you, and then perhaps you'll get the funding to do these films that are going to take you to the red carpet, however many years down the line. It is absolutely not That's how it is. We're on the verge of That's building a new way. world together. We are on the verge of building a completely new world together that bypasses all of these previous and corrupt totally corrupt organizations, you know, and, and you know, they are corrupt. You're laughing, you know it's corrupt. I mean, look at what goes in there, you know. You're look not at what, saying look, Hollywood is corrupt. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that, and you can't take it away from us. It's like, I, it really makes me sad when you're like, let, just put it, up, put it up online just in case I happen to be able to market myself to the old world, when it's like we're at a point where we could be building a new world You're together. a pioneer, I can see it. The minute I walked in the room. <laughs> I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and I agree. I agree with what you're saying. I think the old world distribution is still there for mega, mega 
big films like Batman sequels or whatever. And, but, you know, the, 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 real, the realistic picture is that the majority of people aren't going to get to that situation. And I was thinking more about how much money do I need to live and be a filmmaker? And, like, if I could make a film, say it cost me five grand, just a, this is just an example. I'm thinking more documentary than, than narrative, right? Uh, I then can sell that film and make back 15 grand on, on that, right? That film, I spent six months doing that. Like, I do that twice a year. You've got to understand that then, it's like when you sit on panels, and for example, I was with uh, Jim took a bunch of people and they were talking, Someone brought up Zeitgeist and Loose Change, these two films, and you could see the, the, prof like the professionals turning their nose up at these films. And it's like, wow, you're turning your nose up at Zeitgeist, been watched by like 60 million people. I mean, it's like one of the touchstones of what people are using, rightly or wrongly, to think about the future of the world's development. And yet, and really what happens is, someone will want to say to you, what you were talking about is not film as I understand it. It is not being made for the future promise of getting into the Oscars, and it's not being made with the future of being you being real with festival recognition. And therefore, I do not recognise what you are doing. Far, far as many people are concerned, I think it's sad, you know, that this is as good as the cat teeth brushing video on YouTube. And I, I deny it, and I think you have a total right to think about what you're doing as legitimate in filmmaking. I think, I think yeah. the important thing about it is to think of the British film industry as a British film industry, not the British film industry. Yeah. If you want to go and feed from the hands of the Chris's from earlier before, I mean, that's what their job is, is to support their corner of a British film industry. You're in a different one. Yeah. James is in a different one. Uh, yeah, perhaps. I, I There's no validity question about either. It's, I not, it's, they're, they're not, it's not adversarial. No. It's maybe a mean, it's, it's dangerous to some people that you want to walk down the red path and don't you? Don't put Okay. That idea in 6,000 media graduates' heads a year because you're going to let down 5,999 of them. Actually, a lot, a lot of Hollywood film is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, it is. is. Well, I mean, the, the majority of the multiplex films are not, you know, they've got loads of money behind them and they're terrible. You know, you can watch much better stuff produced on way, way less budgets. And, uh, you know, no, I think I, what I really just do. But, think but both, really there's great films as well, but there's, you look at the pioneering films of the 1970s, the American independent cinema movement, they were all, like, would be, they would now be shooting on DSLRs for, for very little money, making great films. They'd be no different, it's just the, the technology that, you know, now we don't have to use film, which is really expensive, we can do what we want, People don't, you don't, people, the, the studio system will become less and less irrelevant, and what will happen will be, I think, a, a huge, there will be big budget films, there will still be massive budget films, like, like the, the, the new Batman film and stuff like this, and then there will be huge amounts of other very, very low budget films, which, which I think can sustain us, will potentially be able to sustain itself because of the new model of distribution. People will still go to cinema and watch, like, I keep saying Batman, but they will still go and watch Batman next year. That film will make huge amount of Yeah, I'm going to go watch Batman. And I, I, you know, I'm not saying there isn't these, these great films, but I think this new model's brilliant because it means people do have a chance, even though they're not going to make, they might not make. If you're in it for money, then forget it. But if, you, if you're in it to make enough money to live, I think that's quite doable. To make your short films, make your little documentaries, your niche, whatever, find your audience, make enough money to live. But if you think you're going to make huge amounts of money out of it, you, you know, some people might. Some people might not, but at least that's better than going, if you, you know, I make a short film, it gets shown in a few festivals, which cost me probably 500 quid, and, that's, and, and even more if I have to go there and sit there and watch it, you know, that's, that, that's more than the budget of making the next film. I mean, this is, it, that just seems ridiculous. Like, to say to people that you've got to do this, and, and, and on the chance that you may one day get given like a hundred thousand pounds to make a film, or, or a million pounds to make a film, how many people actually get given that? In, in the scheme of things, it's, such, it, it, it's a massive establishment. Anyway, it's so difficult to break. It's so difficult to break into a, get help from a regional screen agency. Yeah, you, you, should, you should have people from the audience come and sit here, or young producers come and sit here and tell it like it is, because then you, then you really get to see, you know. Yeah, well, I am, that's what I'm doing. I'm in the process of making my next, the next film, and I hope if I make, if I make 15 grand out of it, I'll be happy.
you know. I think there's different levels of distribution for different types of film, and that was pointed out over here really well. And I think there are different industries and different things appeal. But I was a producer on a film recently, and we spent a million dollars on that film, making that film. That isn't going to be the sort of film that is necessarily going to make back a million dollars online, not doing what Jamie does or not doing what I do. The only way to do that is to go through a traditional sales route and make back that money. And then whatever is left could work really well. But on then that the problem online. is that no million dollar films are making back a million dollars anywhere. That's, no, that's absolutely no, true, but it's no, a different, no, it's a different no, no films under eight million dollars. No films under eight million dollars are making back any money anywhere. You know, and so you, so the the question arises: Well, then, then why not encourage people to make films that they can make the money back for, and start working out how we can, you know, how we can how we can value those kinds of personal expressions. You know, I agree. That is what everyone's doing. money is getting smaller and smaller, how, how do we give more people less money to make more films? But as a result, too many films are made, and people are swamped by films, well, and so films don't get seen, because when you've got five million films to choose from, then you're back to Derry's thing, where you go, well, which, which one won the Oscar? I'll watch that one. That's the problem. So, yes, it's democratic, because more people can make films, and yes, it's democratic because more people can distribute their films. But if they're, you know, it doesn't help the situation because then you go back to quality. Ultimately. You're, you're asking you about you're asking the about the attention problem again, which is, it, and I, I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. You know, I think that the essential change that's occurred, the, the essential structural change that's occurred, is from needing an immense amount of capital to distribute to distribute film or sound or or, or text to needing none, or next to none, you know, and that change means that the problem of distribution is in essence solved. The problem of making money distribution is not solved. The problem of distribution itself is solved, and you then have a series of sort of six problems circling that. And one of them, one of them is revenue and monetization, and another is attention. How do you get people to know that they want to, to know about a thing and know that they want to see it? And if you look online, there are literally, I mean, probably at least 150 startups dealing with that problem right now, because it's quite clearly a frontier problem. You know, it's like, we know that you want to see something, maybe 10 things a week, maybe five things a week, depending, and we, we need to work out how to get you to see the things you would like to see. And by no means is, I'll just watch what was, I mean, there are already sites like Metacritic and uh, Rotten Tomatoes that I'm sure a lot of people are using that aggregate reviews. This is just one example. Aggregate scores from different papers provide a score and give you a rough idea of what telly is worth watching so you know that The Wire is good and HBO and Sons of Anarchy and you know, so on and so on. You know what's good. This is one example. Another would be friend of a friend. You know, what does your friend like? What are they watching? What are their friends watching? So, you know, the, the, you can't just stand in front of the future and say, well, this is a completely fucked problem, it's never going to... You know, people are working on these, and, 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 and the, the, the thing is, we can be working on them. It's a world which is open for us to work on solutions, as the people who are making stuff. Do you, do you, do you understand Tomorrow what I'm saying? Tomorrow belongs to us. <laughs> well, you, you, you can try and play the cynic, but, you know, in the end, it's, it's not a massively positive message, is it? I'm not, the, the I'm not one really about everyone cynic. should, think, should wait, for, wait for Oscars. I think it Oscars. is horses for courses, and I think, as far as I'm concerned, I, as a distributor, I will only ever be interested in distributing what I consider to be a quality film. It doesn't mean it has to be made with 50,000 sterling or whatever. I have one little film at the moment that's probably cost about 15,000 to make, um, under a scheme in, in Ireland which uh, one of the um, cooperative groups run and uh, we think it's one of the possibilities for a, an Oscar nomination next year and that in our view is you know, putting it up there with some of the best short films in the world and we should be talking more about short films as I say that have a, a beginning, a middle and an end <laughs> One more uh, question for you to all um, guests today, in a sense, and speakers. I mean. um, what would interest maybe all of us is really um, the promises distribution companies also make. 
So in regards, I would like to ask, for example, Richard, um, if Derek doesn't mind, if you can get an average about really some, what would you actually promise in January? What would you promise we produce in return? Because there's, there has to be a trust relationship, as you know yourself, with time. It has to be developed, so that would be really interesting to see with all the kind of planning and the services you're doing, because you actually do a service at the end of the day. And you have your charges, or you will actually have your shares and revenues, which you have to share with the producers, because as you know, producers of production companies are the end chain, and filmmakers have to struggle with that. So how do you see really helping out filmmakers? Because I've been two years in a convention at the Berlin Film Festival where Distributors that more or less producers have to pay everything because they don't have much money anymore to distribute or market. So it's a question of how do you see that, and especially with short films. Um, the question, what, what are you able to promise people at the outset? Let's say that this is a very difficult thing. It depends on the product. I mean, you know, as Derry explained, if you already you know, won an Oscar or something, it would be easier to sell. Uh, but let's go from the average, not the Oscar winner, right? Something which to get an idea really here of where in which direction we're going, like the tradition. And maybe. Is, is your question let's say, which of these is most important? Maybe. We don't know it yet. <laughs> Ours, I think, is the most transparent model. What we're offering is a sale, it comes to you. We're not a marketing company. That's not what Chargeplay does. Mm -hmm. We facilitate all that technical stuff, like I was trying to say on the video, that lets you give the opportunity for people to watch it. We're not the company that tells people and brings people to that. And so for a short film, it would be the opportunity for you to take that and put it somewhere on, a, on your website and promote that. At the moment, we don't take a fee. It's a free service. Right. And what is your intention? Um, our intention, we're, we're going to build a front-facing website. Well, that's what we're doing at the moment. And that hopefully will bring um, an audience. And then we'll have metrics that we can say, this is what we're going to do. If you're on the home page, you're likely to do this, and then that will be a different relationship. And that will be part of our fi uh, revenue structure in the future. That's the plan anyway. And I'm sensing with the rest of you, you're, you're not able to say it, are you? Um, I, I am capable of saying it, but I don't say it to producers. I mean, I try and say, look, you know, uh, well, there's a, we've 850 films in our catalogue. Uh, so, it depends on the genre, mm -hmm. and it depends on the market uh, as we find it. And uh, you know, if you had a comedy that was nominated for an Oscar, and it also was an animation piece, then I think you could be talking about twenty-five to thirty thousand uh, dollars uh, for television sales. In terms of what you would hand to the producer, uh, I, that's just gross. Say. So, what would you hand to them? Uh, I take thirty percent plus direct sales costs, but it's, we market everything, we go to all the shows yeah. at our expense, put our DVD compilations together at our expense, the, 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 the director or producer only uh, covers direct sales costs from the, the sales of the broadcaster or the DVD company. And Suzanne, your model presumably works when you have something very specific, yes. with a very specific audience in mind. And it's not a massively lucrative one, but it gets your material out, gets this material out. Yes, I mean, it's not massively lucrative, but it's, um, I don't think it's less than for the, the documentaries or anything like that. So okay. we don't separate it. It's the same fee that we have for the other ones. So. Yeah, just so everyone's clear, I mean, the, the thing I should have said too early on is the, the traditional model, as I call it, the television route, right, is um, you, you're paid by the minute in most cases, and you're talking about anything from as little as $25 a minute, which is really low, to the top price would be um, Canal Plus in France, who would pay anything between 350 and 450 euros a minute, and Arte might pay the same, um, except Arte take both France and Germany when they do their buy, so you've lost one market. But, um, you know, there's th that's what you're dealing with. Anything, a, a standard price might be $100 a minute, an average price. Do you want to have a last word? So not, no well, I want to get answer rich the, on this. I'd like to answer the question. If that's <laughs> I'd like to answer the yeah. question, if that's Go possible. Ahead. Well, so, yeah, I mean, again, it's I could name peak, <laughs> I, I could name sort of the, the top earners, and then 
but it's not entirely representative because because obviously for example you know the yes men earn fifty thousand dollars through us we take 25 percent that means they receive a check of about they received about thirty eight thousand um, dollars from us um, we did our own science fiction show that reached about two and a half million people that has I think made a hundred thousand dollars in direct audience contributions they've, they've taken seventy five thousand dollars from us and then we also received about thirty thousand dollars in advertising contributions which we do pre-rolls before that so they they take 25 percent of that so they would have received you know around ten thousand dollars so I guess they probably received about a hundred and hundred and five thousand dollars that's a rough rough guess without checking that will be the peak cases then we've we've had sort of um, you know the, the the lowest we would I guess we would make for an, you know an independent film that would be up on the site over a year would be sort of fifteen to twenty thousand and then they'd be, they'd get, they receive seventy five percent of that so it's quite variable um, but we've had filmmakers you know upload their we what we've been trying to do to maximize profits for filmmakers is serializing the films because we realize people you know you get a film some we had a film someone to spend quarter of a million dollars on it and um, you know, you don't just want to put it online, give it away, and then it's, it's done. You know, people's attention span quite short. So what we've been doing is serializing it, and that gives us a chance to sell space before each episode. It, it, it's slightly brutal, but it, it gets, sort of gets the job done, you know, and it lets the audience build across the episodes. And that guy made, I mean, he's just made um, six, yeah, like six, seven thousand dollars on his first episode, so he looks set to make, what, set? And do five episodes, like thirty-five, forty thousand dollars for the whole, which you just be, and then he retains the right to sell yeah. to anybody else. And Jack, so. does he know, do you give him the data of who's taking this film? Is he now got a hundred thousand people he can email saying like, the film is out? Of <laughs> yeah, the film? and then people do. Some people do do that. Yeah, we supply details of every every donor. Yeah, with their with their email address. So. So you can you can spam them if you want. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's welcome to my world. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, that's the kind of old school. In people do yeah use the emails and sort of communicate. And I think, well, you know, people don't respond to their email that much. But I think it's another part of the value chain, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, when we see it most successful, just by the way, in case there's any producers, the most successful thing is like when people have got their own website. And they've got a product. They've got a product. They've finished. You know, they're working on which is, and they put themselves out there and connect with the audience through their website, and then use us just to get the raw numbers. And then what happens is you get a circulation between their website and us, and it seems to increase the donation amount. It seems to get people, you know, get people donating or sponsoring or whatever. So yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I'm so sorry that we are completely out of time now. I feel that today we've talked, talked about the past a lot, we've talked about the present a lot, but I'm really glad that the bit that got most heated was talking about the future. So, um, thank you so much to our panel for all the contributions, and I think, are all of you staying around? Yeah. yeah. And all of you are staying around, so you can carry on and argue to your hearts and talk <laughs> about the best way of doing things. But thank you very much, it's been a